please welcome Alex and Rhys, and they will be talking about open telemetry. So over to you guys. Thank you. Hello. Oh, oh. <laughs> we haven't started. Maybe, maybe hold off until we start. <laughs> Just in case. Um, good. <laughs> okay, okay. Good morning and welcome. Um, so my esteemed co-presenter over here, Alex Bowen, realized that there wasn't a single place he could go to to reference tools that are useful for any stage, let alone all stages of your OpenTLMG journey. So we are very excited to have put this together for you. OpenTLMG Toolbox, tools you should never leave the house without. Yay! <laughs> So with that context in mind, how we've laid out our session um, is starting at the very beginning, where you're just trying out OpenTelemetry, to instrumenting your own application in a local dev environment, to sending that data somewhere, and then finally, to deploying it in production. So before we get started, we wanted to do a quick survey, um, just a round of hands, how many people here are familiar or have heard of OpenTelemetry? Oh, OK. How many of you have tried it? Oh, OK. How many of you are running it in production? Oh, damn. OK. Well, well, well. Um, for those of you less familiar with, we'll just do a quick refresher on what is open telemetry. Oh. So open telemetry is an open source observability framework observability. It comes with a set of language-specific APIs, SDKs, uh, instrumentation libraries, and tools that you can use. It aims to standardize how well, uh, applications are instrumented and how telemetry is generated, collected, and transmitted. It's also a community. It's made up of multiple um, special interest groups, working groups, a technical committee, a governance committee, as well as, of course, our end users. And of course, uh, for those of you who are to use it, you know that it allows you to be vendor agnostic. You can instrument your applications once and send your data to any backend or backends of your choice. OpenTelemetry is not a data visualization tool. Um, it doesn't include things such as alerts. Uh, it doesn't store uh, your data. So you still need to send that data somewhere to analyze it. Oh, I already said that. So, as promised, we're going to start at the very beginner stage where you're trying out open telemetry. And, um, you know, we guess you probably want something that's easy to set up and that allows you to quickly see some OTEL data. The first tool we're going to talk about is OTEL CLI. Um, since so many of you have already tried open telemetry, you may already have heard of this tool. It is a command line interface tool that allows you to send traces to a collector from the command line. And if you're not sure what a collector is, Alex is going to go over that more in depth later on. I know he is so antsy to tell you about it. <laughs> so uh, this is a good tool for getting started because it allows you to get um, started with distributed tracing quickly. You can easily add tracing to shell scripts as well as other applications that um, don't support tracing natively. And it's really simple. However, it requires a few things to set up, including a working Go environment. So it may still be a little bit confusing depending on your familiarity with Go. Telemetry Gen is another solid tool to try open telemetry out. It is a utility that simulates the client to generate traces, metrics, and logs. Um, yes, and it does not require an application. So. Fairly simple. However, the data that it produces is pretty basic. Um, it's not very realistic. Um, we'll see. But it's still a quick way to see open telemetry data. And we'll see an example of a span uh, that's simulated by this tool in the next slide. Um, but again, it also requires a working Go environment. So depending on how comfortable you are with Go and if you need to upgrade it or anything, that could be another piece to consider. So this is an example of a span that is generated by telemetry gen. Again, pretty basic, but it, it uh, lets you get started quickly and allows you to see some OTIL trace data. So what about when you're ready to try something a bit more complex, but you don't want to go through the trouble of instrumenting your own applications just yet? So this is a great stage to try out the open telemetry community demo. Is anyone here who has tried out the demo? 
Oh, quite a few people. All right. So if you're familiar with the old GCP hipster shop, um, this is a very nicely updated version of that. And it's made up of several microservices um, that talk to each other over gRPC and HTTP. It comes with a load generator that simulates user traffic. Um, and yeah, this is just to show you how they're connected. And now we're going to look at so the tele telemetry that's generated from the application. It makes its way to the collector, which again, you'll learn more about in a little bit. Um, the collector will then ingest the data, transform it in some way according to the configuration, and then finally it gets transmitted, in this case to two backends. Um, it makes its way to Jaeger, which is an open source uh, backend for traces, and also Prometheus, which collects and stores metrics, and you can see the metrics visualized in Grafana. So there's a few purposes to the demo. One is to provide a realistic example of a distributed system so um, you can see how OpenTelem2 works and to demonstrate how it works. It provides a base for vendors, tooling authors, and anyone else really who wants to extend and demonstrate their OpenTelem2 integrations. Um, and it also provides a living example that contributors can use to test like new versions of the API, SDK, and other components. Oh, the demo also comes with a UI that you can access in the browser. You can poke around and generate your own um, traffic and kind of see the trace that results to get an idea of like how things are working. So as you just learned, it comes with a couple backends. So for example, you can navigate to Jaeger straight in your UI. And in this case, you can select cut service and you'll see a list of traces that um, where this service was involved in. You can click into any one of those. And here is an example of a specific trace from the list that was um, on the previous slide. So you can see things like name of um, the spans. You can look at the child spans, where it occurred, as well as the duration, for example. You can run the app um, locally using Docker. You can run it on Kubernetes using either a manifest YAML, a YAML manifest or the demo app's Helm chart. And all the things that we just talked about are what make the demo great for trying it out um, as a next step up before you uh, try with your own applications. Because you can use it to view various instrumentation examples in different languages. Um, you can modify it to test and experiment with things. It provides more realistic data that you would see in a prod environment. And it also includes a few problem-solving scenarios to help you interpret your OTEL data and use it and use OTEL to solve them. It also includes backends, but you can change who um, gets the data. Um, so if you wanted to look at the data in a specific vendor's backend, you can do that. But of course, uh, it can be very overwhelming. Um, there's a lot of pieces, and because of that, you might run into Issues trying to run it locally, um, I have before, so just something to keep in mind, but it is a really cool tool. Okay, so now we've filled your first drawer with some useful tools to help you try out open telemetry. What about when you're ready to take the next step? Thanks, Alex. Reese. So after, okay. thank you. All right, after seeing uh, what Reese has shown me, I'm really excited to try open telemetry, and I really wanted to try with my own application. Um, to reduce the time it would take me to instrument code, I just decided to go with auto instrumentation. And I have two different applications I wanted to instrument. There's a Python server and a Go server. Um, what I'm going to show you is my journey through the auto instrumentation process, because I did run into a few bumps. And I thought maybe people that have run into these bumps may benefit from it. So, so bear with me as I explain to you what the application is. It's not super important, but you know, just so you have an idea. So this is the application I was instrumenting. It's a Flask application. It just has like an endpoint. I set up my uh, requirements file, and then I set up a virtual environment. Not super exciting. But auto instrumentation in Python provides a wrapper that loads all instrumented libraries. Uh, it also provides a tool called OpenTelemetry Bootstrap that allows you to list all of the instrumentations that exist for things in your environment. And then you can install it with this nice little command at the bottom. So. 
Here I thought I would be good to go. So this is the open telemetry instrument command that wraps the execution of the Python script. And I thought, this is great. This is all I need to do. I'm done, right? Um, unfortunately, I was not expecting to see this error message. And I thought, well, this is weird. I, I wonder if there's something I can do to debug this error long, you know, further, because I'm completely unfamiliar with any of this. I don't know what gRPC is or proto, OTLP, whatever this is. Then I remember there's an environment variable called OTEL log level. This is defined in the OpenTelemetry spec, which uh, defines all of the features across uh, all implementations. And I thought, wow, this is going to show me what's happening in the SDK. This is great. So I ran the script with this environment variable. And uh, unfortunately, I made no progress. Then I remember there's a compatibility matrix that shows you what is implemented in what languages. And unfortunately, as you can see down here, uh, it is not implemented. Thankfully, it's highlighted in blue as not implemented, but it's still not implemented. It's only blue because there's a link to the issue that's open about implementing it. Anyways, so this is a really useful tool to know about, the open telemetry compatibility matrix. It's a document that shows you what features are implemented in what languages. It's great uh, until it's out of date. As with all documents, things get out of date. Um, it's also not the easiest to parse because there's like 11 different languages, so the table is really wide, and you know you kind of have to like manually figure out. Anyway, it's, it's great. Go check it out. So now that I gave up on this hotel log level thing, um, <laughs> I decided to remember what what OTLP was, and I remember that by default um, the open Telemetry Python instrumentation, auto instrumentation sets up an OTLP exporter for uh, all the signals. But I'm not ready for OTLP yet. Um, we'll talk more about what OTLP is in a second. So I decided to use the console exporter, which is just like a standard out exporter uh, for your telemetry. So ran it again. And I thought, great, there's no more error messages. But then when I make a request, I was expecting to see at least like a span or like a metric or something. Instead, I just get this blob of like resource attributes which is neat, but it doesn't really tell me anything about my application. And at this point, I'm like, what is, like, what is going on? Maybe something is misconfigured or whatever. So I decided to do a pip freeze to see what's installed in my environment. Um, here, I was really surprised, because somewhere along here, I was expecting to see like open telemetry instrumentation Flask installed. I did a search through the Python repo. It turns out I was using Flask 3.0. There's a bug open that says it's not supported yet. And sure enough, if I scroll all the way back to my error messages, there was a really handy message that just says, it's not supported, skipping. I wish I would have seen this like at the very beginning. Uh, that would have saved me probably like an hour of time. But anyways, so I downgraded Flask, reinstalled the instrumentation package manually, this time just to be sure it was installed. And here we go. I finally have a span. It was so good, right? Like you can see the span information. What you don't see uh, is there's also metrics being captured by the auto instrumentation. But um, yeah, so I was super excited. This is this is great. So um, an excellent tool to be aware of, console exporter. Um, it's kind of like printf for your telemetry. Honestly, I feel like printf will never go out of fashion. Um, so it's super handy because you know if I had been using the OTLP exporter and I didn't see any data, I would have started down a path of like trying to debug: is my destination broken or is anything like it would have just been a mess. But instead, with the console exporter, you can just see that you know something is emitted, and that's that's pretty useful. In fact, we'll come back to the console exporter later. Anyways, so I mentioned earlier I also had a Go application. Now that I finally got data and I saw how amazing it was, I thought, OK, I'm ready to go. I'm going to get this Go, Go version in like no time. So the Go auto instrumentation uses eBPF, uh, which, allows you to, which allows it to set up uprobes. Um, if you don't know about eBPF or you're interested, I'm sure there will be many talks about eBPF at, at this conference coming up this week. What, what is it called? Cube, cube something? Um, anyway, so um, the Go Auto instrumentation supports Ubuntu, which meant because I have a Mac, I ended up running everything in Docker. Uh, thankfully, the repo for the auto instrumentation has really handy steps to do this. This is really small font, but you can kind of see there's two services defined. The first one is just my application. Uh, the second one is the auto instrumentation that hooks into my application. Uh, and you can see here I specified the console exporter because I'm a big fan of the console exporter. Then I looked at the logs. It looks like something is instrumented. Awesome. That's great. I'm going to make a request, and everything will be working right. Um, unfortunately, so you can see there's like 
a little bit of information about my request. It's not great, though, because down here I can see an error going to some port 4317, which, if you're not familiar, that's the OTLP port. It looks like my environment variable doesn't work for my console exporter. And sure enough, I searched through all of the Go Auto instrumentation. And uh, you can see here, uh, establishing connection to OTLP receiver, which I had not asked it to, but it did anyways. So after looking through the code, OTLP exporter was the only exporter available for Go Auto instrumentation at the time of this demo. There is an issue. I actually submitted a fix as part of this work <laughs> to try and get the console exporter in there. So hopefully that's going to come soon, but it's not there yet. So just everybody knows all these problems that I've run into, there's either issues or there's someone working on trying to fix it. So auto instrumentation, it's amazing. I was able to get telemetry sort of uh, without any code changes. It's fairly low cost. This is a slide where I have to make the mandatory statement. Auto instrumentation will never be as good as manual instrumentation. It just can't be as detailed as you want it to be. However, auto instrumentation does intercept calls to third-party libraries that you might not instrument otherwise. Okay, now we're ready to talk about OTLP because I, you know, I only have one choice for my goal on instrumentation is to have an OTLP backend. So, um, OTLP is a protocol defined by Open Telemetry. It's the Open Telemetry protocol. Some people might say it's the Open Telemetry line protocol. That is false. There is no word line in it. It's just the Open Telemetry protocol. Nobody knows what the L stands for. Um, so the cool thing about OTLP is that it's adopted by many vendors and many open source projects. And um, this is kind of a regular setup. You might have your application, you might have the cloud, and you might send your data to a hosted backend. I don't want to send my data to a hosted backend because I'm sure to mess up an API token somewhere. So I'm going to set up a local OTLP destination um, to do that. So this is kind of the setup. Um, this is just me having to install the OTLP exporter in Python so that I would get over that error message that I was seeing earlier. Um, I also got kind of tired of making manual go curl requests, so I just wrote a little OTL curl, which also instruments the client-side application requests. Uh, and so all of these three applications are sending data to an OTLP destination. Now, what OTLP destination can we use? Personally, I like the OTL desktop viewer. It's a Go app that just sets up an OTLP port uh, and allows you to view the data that comes in through a minimal user interface. Um, it doesn't support other uh, signals than traces. I would like it to, but anyways, I'll talk more about that later. So now after a few seconds, we can start seeing data up here, which is exciting. I finally have like a visual representation of my data. Fortunately, you can see I'm missing my span here which reminded me that I forgot to update my OTLP endpoint for my client application, which I did. And now you can see this super duper handy trace. It's you know a client talking to a server, although with the service name being unknown service for post, you don't really know what you're getting. So I updated this via another environment variable called OTEL service name for each one of my applications. And now I can finally get a clear idea of what's, what's happening in my, in my code. This is where I want to make a Take a pause and give a shout out to environment variables. They're great. Um, if you haven't used them before, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, the, the OTEL SDK has many supported environment variables. You can see all of them in the specification itself. As you saw earlier, though, your level of support across languages may vary. So you know, beware. Also, environment variables are really hard to remember if you've forgotten to set them. I, I find that like it's really easy to just start an application and forget one environment variable. and Anyways, okay. Then I remember I also have a Go application, and this is what my Go application looked like. You can see the curls going, coming from the client. You can see the responses from the server, but they're not, they're not connected. So this kind of looks like a context propagation problem. So for context to be propagated between the client and the server, there's usually some kind of propagation mechanism, usually the HTTP headers, not always. But it looks like something wasn't working. So I was expecting to look at the, the like at the output for my request headers and just to be able to see something. This is where I want to take one moment to uh, give a shout out to one of my favorite tools of all times, TCP dump. It's my big hammer. Um, I, you know, sometimes I just find it's easier to look at the bytes on the wire than trying to debug application code. So sure enough, if you look at the request, so this is me doing a TCP dump on uh, the port for my uh, Go server. You can see there's no request header that includes any information about the trace. 
this is the one I remember that I broke something on my client. This is just like a, a, how you set a propagator in the Go application. So you know, I needed to set up this trace context propagator that I forgot. And sure enough, now you can see there is this trace parent header, which is super handy. That includes like uh, the span ID and, and uh, the parent ID, trace ID, sorry. And now my trace is connected, which is super duper exciting. Uh, by the way, if the propagation was working on the client, I would have, like if I would have seen that request with the header in the first place, I would have looked now on the server side because I knew at least the client is doing the right thing. Okay. So the, uh, the Hotel Desktop Viewer is great. It's my tool of choice for viewing data locally. Um, I like that it's um, like pretty quick to set up. It's just like a quick Go app to run. There's, it's not the only open source tool available, as we showed. There's Jaeger you can use for, your OTL, for traces. There's Prometheus you can use for metrics. Both of those support OTLP natively. Um, unfortunately, this tool uh, only supports traces, as I mentioned. And I do not recommend it beyond development. Very important. Do not deploy this in production and expect this to just work. OK, so this is all for my local development. It's great. But now I want to send my data to somewhere that's like kind of getting me to production. This is where the hotel collector comes in handy. Um, this is kind of the Swiss army knife of tools in open telemetry. Uh, I am going to use my collector as an OTLP destination. And then using YAML configuration, I'm going to send the data off to Jaeger and Prometheus. This is what a YAML file looks like if you haven't seen YAML before. But this is specifically the YAML for the collector. There's you know, a couple of pipelines that I set up for metrics and for traces. And I thought, yay, I'm going to see data right away. Unfortunately, the first thing that happened was no data was going anywhere. Um, and this is where I wasn't sure if like, the data was getting stuck in my pipeline, because my collector output was pretty straightforward. It just says, everything is ready. Sounds pretty promising. Um, then I remembered that um, there's a debug exporter. It used to be called the logging exporter. It was very confusing. Now it's called debug exporter. Uh, which is the equivalent of the console exporter I mentioned earlier for the SDK, uh, to be able to see if any data is coming into my pipeline. So I just added it as an exporter to both pipelines. And sure enough, when I restarted my collector, I saw that no data was coming in. This pointed me to the problem of the fact that I hadn't changed my OTLP destination from the hotel desktop viewer to the collector. When I did that, data showed up in the output. And of course, now data shows up in my backends. Yay, it's exciting. So the collector is great for doing all sorts of things. Uh, we, we're not going to be touching the processing capabilities of the collector in this talk, but it, it's great for doing all sorts of transformation on your data. Um, the best thing about the collector is that you can set it up, and then you can have all your applications and your data to it. And then um, any kind of processing or any kind of like sending it to a, a different destination, you can just modify YAML and it'll happen for you, which is great. There's also something like 240 components for the collector. So it's, there's a lot of stuff in there. So the community manages two distributions of the collector. There's the core, uh, which has this lovely set of components, which is a very small subset of components. Then there's contrib. Um, I couldn't make the font small enough to fit all the components on here. This is cut off at receivers. There's like a whole list of other components that's missing here. Um, so what if, you, what if you don't want the minimal component because you really care about this F cloud exporter that's right over here? And you don't want this because this is kind of, this is a lot. Um, what do you do? Well, thankfully, there's the OTAL collector builder, which allows you to specify a manifest file. Then you run this beautiful go command to install the builder and run the builder. Um, and then you can get a, a list of all the files that are generated by the builder, but also the binary that you really want. So the builder is great um, if you want your own uh, version of the collector that's just right for you. Highly recommended. Unfortunately, oh, by the way, this will make SecOps really happy because you've limited the number of components that they have to worry about. Uh, it can also dramatically so reduce the size of the binary that's produced. Um, downside is it's one more thing to manage, which kind of sucks. Um, but anyways, now that you have your collector and you're, you're totally ready with all your instrumented code, I'm going to pass it back to Reese, who's going to get us to production. Thank you, Alex. All right. So you just learned about the collector, which is a super cool tool. And when you are ready, to deploy into production, you have several options for where and how to install the collector. So
So you can use Docker, which is also great for running it locally. You can install it as a standalone binary on bare metal on Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. Uh, if Nomad is your orchestrator of choice, you can deploy it there. And of course, Kubernetes, which we are guessing that's probably most of you out there. So we'll touch a little bit on the two options you can use, Helm chart and operator. I do know that we are running up on time, so um, we'll just take a quick little look here. So the collector Helm chart is one of the ways you can install the collector on Kubernetes. It facil facilitates the installation and management of, um, of a collector deployment in Kubernetes. The chart supports three deployment modes, um, and it requires you to set one depending on what your use case calls for. So daemon set, deployment, or stateful set. And because a lot of the components that you would want to use for the collector require special setup and permissions to access the Kubernetes API server, it comes with a few um, some handy presets to help you configure those a little bit easier. However, Helm charts can be complex, and the presets are recommended as a starting point. If you need to add extra or more advanced configuration, it's recommended that you do that manually. This is the default config file for the collector uh, that comes with the Helm chart, and you can see the default components that it provides, um, and you can update these settings by uh, changing the values.yaml file. There is also the operator, which is an implementation of the Kubernetes operator. And it has two primary functions, which is to manage the collector, as well as to inject auto instrumentation of workloads using OTEL instrumentation libraries. So you don't ever have to touch code, as you learned about that with um, Alex earlier. The operator creates a config map um, that contains a collector config. So anytime you modify the collector config, it will actually automatically restart all related collector instances for you. It also supports the use of an optional tool, but potentially useful thing called the target allocator, which manages Prometheus metrics without the need to install Prometheus. And it supports all four deployment modes, so whatever um, the Helm chart supports plus sidecar. However, as you also just found out, auto instrumentation is not available in all languages at this time, so you want to double check with the language or languages that you're using, and operator expects um, Start Manager to be installed on the cluster, so that's another thing to consider. And finally, um, there are some components that are not recommended to be used depending on the deployment mode that you're using, so I would recommend looking at the documentation for that. And I believe we have time to cover a couple of bonus tools that made it in last minute. Um, and also there's like other tools, of course, um, load balancing um, export that we didn't cover, but Otelbin is a cool one that came to our attention in the last week. Um, we just have a UI, uh, sorry, a screenshot of it, but it's a way to configure, check your configuration and validate your um, collector config, which is something I've heard that end users really want, so you might find this really handy. Um, it is still in the early days, and we didn't have enough time to get our local dev set up, uh, dev environment set up, but it looks really cool. And also, the builder GitHub action, which since Alex built, helped build, I'm going to have him. Yeah. I can chat about it. Oh. Yeah. I forget. I keep forgetting. You can. There. there we go. Oh. Um, yeah, so the, uh, I got tired of having to create a repo that contained all of the same like actions, so run the builder, install the builder, and you know have a bunch of files. So I thought, why not just have a GitHub action that can do all of this for us? Um, this, so I wrote this GitHub action. It's still very, like, very alpha, if, if even alpha. Uh, but you can just check in a manifest file, create a uh, workflow in GitHub that looks kind of like this, uh, and it will automatically generate a binary of the collector for you, which is super handy if you happen to have many repositories, like myself, that just have like a tiny bit of code to generate collectors. Uh, yeah, so try it out. I'm, I'm looking forward to adding Docker support to it. But anyways. Um, and I think that's it. I think that's all we have. Thank you. Question? I just want to plug the observability party that um, New York is hosting with Honeycomb and Observe IQ is happening tomorrow. It's going to say sold out online. It's not. Um, so we would love to see you tomorrow night. And I think um, we're ready for questions, I guess. Could you talk a little bit about um, 
the relative merits of auto instrumentation versus doing it by hand the hard way. Um, I've heard stories of auto instrumentation gone horribly wrong at great expense. Um, and uh, just wondering what the balance is of learning curve between wanting to see something in a toy test environment versus having control over exactly what you're looking for in a production environment. Yeah, um, so I think depending on which implementation you're using, there's different uh, configuration you can use to do various filtering for what data is actually emitted by auto instrumentation. So I would probably start with just trying out to have a look at it like in your dev environment to get a sense for what's happening. Um, and then tweak it maybe before putting it into production, uh, if you can. If you can't, then I would definitely want to send all the data that's generated to a place where it's not going to cost me money first. So maybe have like a collector that's running, and then you can see the data locally before sending it to like a third party vendor, for example. Um, I've definitely found it super useful when I'm starting with a new language, especially. Um, you know, some implementation implementations are quite uh, quite advanced, like the Java uh, auto instrumentation is really good. Um, so yeah, I think your your mileage may vary, but when you're just getting started, it's it's great. Thank you. More questions? Yeah. Um, well, f first a comment, then a question. Um, the comment is you just demonstrated how complicated it is, it is to use open telemetry even as of today, like it's not a new project, but it still felt very complicated to use at first at, or, or to implement in the code. Uh, the question then is uh, how would you move or translate traces from auto trace to implementing into your code? Like you start with auto trace, you have something, and then you say, okay, now I think it's time to implement in my code because I want more. But how would you, what would you do to keep? the original traces from auto trace to kind of still be the same and not be lost into your old traces versus your new tra the new traces you're getting to generate. Um, yeah, so what you would do is you would use the API from the open telemetry API and just instrument your own code. Um, and auto instrumentation should work with your own manually instrumented code, like basically seamlessly. Um, when you're adding like a span to a, a function call in your code, uh, if you're using auto instrumentation to do the kind of the running of the, the code, it should just add that span inside whatever context is current inside your application. So it should work seamlessly. You keep the auto and the yeah. And you add your own at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So I think auto instrumentation get, can get you maybe like 60% of the way to like an instrumented application. Um, so then the last like you know 40% is just you manually instrumenting the code that you care about. But then you combine that with the stuff that's generated through auto instrumentation. And as mentioned earlier, if auto instrumentation is generating way too much noise for you, you want to have some kind of filtering, uh, either at the application level or at the collector level, to just filter that out. Yeah. Okay, we run out of time for more questions. We will be back at 11:25. We have a slightly bigger uh, break this time. Okay, thank you.